his rocket is the biggest one ever built so far, and it's bigger than the uh, the uh, Statue of Liberty. And to, to lift all of that mass into wow. space is, is absolutely incredible. So well, he's taken steps way faster than we ever did in the Apollo program to do things like this. So it's a very exciting time for anyone that follows space. The Apollo program remains one of humanity's most extraordinary achievements. The first time humans landed on the moon. It was such a monumental feat that, more than 50 years later, no one has done it again. But former NASA astronaut Clayton Anderson offers an interesting perspective on why that might be. He notes that NASA, while highly capable, can sometimes be slow-moving and weighed down by bureaucracy. In contrast, he says, SpaceX, under Elon Musk's leadership, is focused on rapid development and innovation, pushing boundaries at a pace that far outstrips the Apollo era. So, is he right? Is SpaceX's approach better than one of the most amazing feats of mankind? The Saturn V rocket played a pivotal role in the famous Apollo missions that first took astronauts to the moon. Built in the 1960s, it was the most powerful rocket ever launched at the time and remains one of the most powerful to this day. Between 1967 and 1973, Saturn V completed 12 missions, including the iconic Apollo 11 landing in 1969. The rocket was developed under the guidance of Werner von Braun, the German rocket scientist often referred to as the father of modern rocketry. His designs shaped the early decades of NASA's space missions. The technology behind the Apollo program was a blend of cutting-edge innovation and skilled manual fabrication, a combination that elevated rocket engineering to something approaching a high art form. To understand how that legacy compares to modern rocket technology, it's useful to look at the engines, the heart of any rocket. Take the Rocketdyne F1 engine, used on the first stage of the Saturn V. Its thrust chamber was a hand-fabricated labyrinth of Inconel X750 alloy tubes. The design began with 178 individually brazed tubes at the fuel manifold near the top of the thrust chamber. These bifurcate at the 3 to 1 expansion plane into 356 individual tubes, expanding with the conical shape of the chamber. At the base, the tubes reversed direction in a 180 degree turn at the turbine exhaust manifold, then returned up the chamber to feed into the injector plate. Everything in the F1 was handcrafted by master fabricators, working with an alloy known for its difficulty, prone to cracking at welds and demanding intense skill. It was revolutionary. The engineers weren't just building something, they were inventing it, step by laborious step. The F1 stands as a testament to sheer determination, craftsmanship, and technical daring. Fast forward to today, and we have the SpaceX Raptor engine, representing the bleeding edge of a new philosophy in space exploration. The core question has shifted from, is this even possible, to how affordable and scalable can we make it? Each new generation of the Raptor engine becomes simpler in design, more powerful, and more reliable, a remarkable feat of modern engineering. While the F1's thrust chamber required painstaking hand fabrication, the Raptor's is mass-produced. Its copper alloy regenerative cooling channels are cast, heated, and mandrel bent into the signature bell shape, then furnace brazed to a strong backing shell made of Inconel or stainless steel. Comparing the two engines on performance metrics like thrust or specific impulse isn't particularly meaningful since they operate on entirely different principles. The F1 is a gas generator open cycle engine running on RP-1 and liquid oxygen, while the Raptor is a full-flow staged combustion cycle engine running on methane and liquid oxygen. In the 1960s, it took about two years to build each F1 engine, at a cost of around $16 million in today's dollars, which is arguably a bargain considering the craftsmanship involved. By contrast, in 2023, SpaceX was producing a new Raptor V2 engine every day at a cost of just $250,000. You see, although I've only focused on one aspect, the engines powering these rockets, it serves as a strong representation of the vastly different design philosophies and construction techniques at play. Apollo marked a peak turning point in human engineering. A moment where what was possible was pushed to the extreme. 
With almost no expense spared, the Saturn V had one very specific mission, to deliver crew and cargo to lunar orbit. Each mission saw its massive stages discarded after use. Once spent, they were left behind, and ground crews would rebuild an entirely new rocket for the next mission. Naturally, this made it incredibly expensive. The entire Apollo program, including development and construction of the Saturn V, cost approximately $25.8 billion in 1960s to 70s dollars. Adjusted for inflation, that's around $257 billion today. NASA justified the spending due to the political urgency and scientific importance of beating the Soviet Union in the space race. But modern rocketry has matured. Today, we operate with a different mindset, one where the ability to reach space is no longer a question of if, but how efficiently. SpaceX's Starship is a perfect example of this evolution. It's designed not as a mission-specific vehicle, but as a multi-purpose, cost-effective Swiss Army knife for space. Starship has a projected cost per launch of just $2 million. That's because, unlike the Saturn V, everything is designed to be recovered and reused. The booster can theoretically be refueled and relaunched in just one hour, and its Raptor 3 engines are built to fly up to 100 times with only routine inspection between flights. While the fundamental physics behind rocket technology hasn't changed, the way it's applied has become almost unrecognizable from the efforts of 60 years ago. It's like comparing a hand-built Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost to a modern car. The Rolls is undeniably a masterpiece of craftsmanship, a triumph of bespoke engineering and design. But the modern car, mass-produced and cost-optimized, is objectively superior in every practical way. It's faster, more reliable, safer, and far cheaper, despite both being built to perform the same fundamental task. That's the technical standpoint, but former NASA astronaut Clayton Anderson also made something else very clear, how fast SpaceX is moving. Here, the difference between how a government agency like NASA operates and how a private enterprise like SpaceX moves becomes starkly apparent. It's not a knock against NASA or the traditional defense contractors they work with, but their approach has long been about achieving perfection without the same pressure to be efficient. They're not beholden to shareholders, they're accountable to taxpayers. Yet because funding comes through Congress, often with little regard to how efficiently that money is spent, the pace of development is slow, steady, conservative, and focused on low-risk, high-reliability outcomes. SpaceX, on the other hand, had to fight its way into the game on a shoestring budget. They had to design a working rocket, prove it could fly, and then ask, sometimes beg, for a chance to show what they could do. Once they got that chance, they delivered. And then they did what most government-backed programs can't afford to do. They iterated fast. That pressure, being just one moment away from failure, pushed SpaceX engineers to perform at their absolute best. After securing some early NASA resupply contracts, they proved they could compete with the big players. Then they went further. They began doing the crazy things, like trying to land orbital-class boosters, and when they succeeded, the world took notice. Suddenly, people were looking at legacy rocket companies and asking, why can't you land your boosters? It's a case study in what happens when free market forces, entrepreneurial grit, and a healthy dose of American ambition collide. One of the best ways to spark innovation in the U.S. is to tell someone something is impossible. That challenge alone is often enough to drive people to reach across the barrier, grab the impossible by the throat, and drag it into reality. It took SpaceX 15 years, a brush with bankruptcy, and an all-or-nothing mindset to reach this point. That said, we shouldn't discount NASA. They once operated with the same kind of urgency and ambition. In the 1960s, the Apollo program brought together some of the brightest minds in science and engineering, and in under eight years, they turned the Saturn V from concept to reality, the most powerful rocket ever built, and flew astronauts to the moon. That, too, was something the world thought impossible. In both cases, it comes down to the right mix of motivation, opportunity, and drive. NASA once had it, and lost it as public interest waned. SpaceX found it in the face of overwhelming doubt. And now, perhaps, that same spirit is making a comeback.
NASA's Artemis program, which aims to return astronauts to the moon for the first time in over 50 years, relies heavily on SpaceX's Starship. Specifically, a modified version of Starship, called the Human Landing System, will ferry astronauts from lunar orbit down to the moon's surface and back. Under the current plan, NASA's powerful Space Launch System, developed by Boeing and other contractors, will launch the Orion Crew Capsule, built by Lockheed Martin. Once in lunar orbit, Orion will dock with the waiting Starship HLS. The astronauts will then transfer to Starship, descend to the moon, complete their mission, and return to Orion for the trip home. Before that can happen, however, SpaceX must first demonstrate a complex orbital refueling process in Earth orbit. Starship's tanks will need to be topped off by multiple tanker flights after launch, so it has enough propellant for the full lunar round trip. This refueling capability is a critical milestone for the Artemis program, but Artemis only scratches the surface of what Starship was designed to do. Elon Musk and SpaceX have far more ambitious plans for Starship. Long before NASA selected Starship for Artemis, SpaceX envisioned it as a fully reusable spacecraft, capable of transporting humans from Earth directly to the Moon and eventually to Mars, without relying on Orion or the SLS. Back in 2017, at the International Astronautical Congress, Musk revealed a vision of Starship, then referred to as the BFR, transporting astronauts from Earth's surface directly to the lunar surface and back. In that original concept, Starship would launch into an elliptical Earth orbit, refuel in space, then travel to the moon. After completing its mission, it would return directly to Earth, protected by its integrated heat shield and guided by aerodynamic fins during re-entry. This original plan eliminated the need for separate launch vehicles, docking in lunar orbit, or coordination between multiple spacecraft. It was a simpler, more self-contained approach, and more ambitious. SpaceX claimed that Starship could carry up to 100 passengers or 100 tons of cargo to the lunar surface. That far exceeds the capabilities required by Artemis. If Starship achieves what it promises, it could enable not just short-term lunar visits, but a sustained human presence on the moon, something the Apollo program never aimed for. A permanent lunar base, similar to the International Space Station, could support scientific research and serve as a stepping stone for deeper space exploration, including Mars.